Let's do this. This is getting started with Kimunda Cloud and ZB Spring using Java. I'm your host, my name is Josh Wolf, and I have no idea what I'm doing, so that makes two of us. I'm just gonna follow the instructions here, which uh, I actually wrote. Hopefully they're gonna work, but let's go through this together. Okay, so getting started with Kimunda Cloud using Java and ZB Spring. Um, video tutorial, that's what we're recording right now. So prerequisites, we need to have the ZB modeler. Obviously you need your, your um, Java kind of environment set up. I'm not gonna cover that in this tutorial. So I'm assuming that you have a Java IDE, you've got the Java virtual machine set up on your you know, development JDK set up on your computer. You won't need to log in like this uh, when you go to get the, the ZB modeler. So the link takes you to the ZB modeler uh, page on GitHub where you can download a release. I've already downloaded it, but you can see that there are versions here for Mac Windows and also for Linux. Okay, I'm gonna move this over to the side and just walk you through it so you can keep it. I've got another monitor over here. Okay, so we're gonna, oh, let me just show you this actually. So we are going to download a Maven Spring Starter from this link here, which takes us to a page where we can download a, uh, a cloud starter that I created. So if I click on generate, it's gonna download a zip file, which I can use to get started. Click on that to open it up. Dun, dun, dun. Let's go back, 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 back. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna unzip the cloud starter. Mm, can I do extract two? Yeah, other folder, here we go, nice. Okay, I'm gonna extract it into my kind of working area, workspace. Put it in Commander. Now, mm, can I create a new folder? Yeah, let's create a new folder. Um, I'm just gonna call it Scratch. It's gonna be the upper level folder. Extract, yeah, extract here. Unzip it to a new directory. Okay, it's extracted. So if we go into Scratch in here, LS, let's have a look. Cloud Starter, okay. So I go into the Cloud Starter. Let's make that bigger so that you can see it. Make it nice and big, nice and big. There we go. Oh, that's weird. Okay, LS, there we go. So I'm using IntelliJ. You can use whatever IDE you like, maybe use Eclipse or I'm not sure what other ones there are. IntelliJ is pretty good though, community edition, um, very nice. It's uh, free to use and it does everything that I need it to do and everything that you need to do to get this uh, getting started working. So it's booting up, here it comes, opens the Cloud Starter project. So yeah, I'm gonna move my instructions across to here and I'm just gonna follow them through. Okay, now we need to add the ZB Spring Client dependency to the POM. Okay, here we go. So I'm just gonna copy and paste the dependency in. Copy from here, drop it into the dependencies. There we go, save that. A little Nyan cat down here, which is pretty cool. Okay, now that I've got that in, uh, I need to create a Kamunda Cloud cluster. So in order to do that, we're gonna log into Kamunda.io. Bring this one back. Let's do it with open a new tab. There we go. Now, if you don't have a Kamunda Cloud account, when you go to Kamunda.io, you'll get the opportunity to create a cloud, uh, Kamunda Cloud account. So Kamunda Cloud is uh, a hosted service and there's like a ZB service in Kamunda Cloud that you can use so you can create a new cluster in there. Log in, create a new ZB 023.3 cluster. Okay. Autofill, yes, there we go. Log in. Okay, I'm logging into the Kamunda Cloud console. So the, the Kamunda Cloud clusters, ZB clusters right now, they run in a Google data center in Belgium. So depending on where you are located in the world, you know, that's gonna determine kind of the speed that you can get with that connection. Europe West 1D. Let's see if I can create a new cluster. Yep, development, free beta, ZB 023.3. So we're gonna give this one a cluster name. Let's call this the uh, Spring Starter Cluster. 
Spring starter. Okay. Um, I'm listening to some progressive house music in my headphones here. I'll turn it down a little bit. Okay, so add. Now, when I click on add, it takes a couple of seconds for it to appear in the, in the UI. And then you can see that it's got a red dot next to it. And over here in status, it says creating. So it's creating the cluster. While it's creating, I can't use it, but I can create client connection credentials, which I believe is the next. Yep, create a new set of client credentials. So we go into here, clients, and then I create a new client. Um, you can give this client kind of any name, right? So we'll just call it um, Cloud Starter. Why not? Add. Okay, added connection information. I click on there and I get this nice connection credentials block. Copy the client connection info environment variables block. So let's do that. Click on copy. I got it. Now I'm going to add the cl client connection credentials to an application.properties file. So if we have a look in here, like project layout, source, main, resources, application.properties. So I'm going to drop it in here. Now, you do need to modify the values here, not the values, the keys. Cluster ID. Now cluster ID for the spring one, I have to take off this last part of the URL. Client ID. Oh, copying and pasting, it's just, it's amazing. Probably the best technology ever invented. Uh, paste this one in here. Default name equals whatever. Okay, so I need to grab that. So this last one here, the authorization server URL is not needed. It's like that, save that. Okay, test the connection. Here we go. We're going to make our connection to the cloud. So to do that, we're going to go into the main class, the cloud starter application class, and we're going to enable the ZB client with this annotation here. Enable ZB client. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so uh, uh, uh. is that correct? Enable ZB client annotation. Maybe I need to synchronize my dependencies. Let's have a look. Dependencies. Yeah. So I added the, the ZB Spring client to the pom.xml, but I need to synchronize my Maven dependencies. Okay, so now when I click on this, boom, automatically imported it. Isn't that great? Okay, so what we're going to do in here is we're going to get a reference. So this is an auto-wired reference to the ZB client, auto-wired, yes. Okay, so it's a private uh, property of the class and the type is a ZB lifecycle client. Client and we'll call it client. And we have to add a semicolon. Get rid of that little window there. Okay, so we now have a ZB client and it, you know, it gets its, there we go. It gets its configuration from the application.properties. So now we're going to create a REST mapping. So to do that, we need to add the REST controller annotation to our class. And we're going to create a mapping here. So yeah, I'll type it out. Why not? Let's go old school. So get, it's a get mapping. So this is a get an HTTP get route, and we're going to put it on status. And then uh, it's going to return a string, which is going to be the broker topology. And we'll just call the method get status. It could be any name, but it's a nice kind of descriptive name for it. And we're going to return a broker topology. Yep. And we'll call it topology. And so we use our client that we auto wired in here and we are going to send a new topology request. New topology. No, no, no tell sense on this. Let's have a look. Dot. It's funny. 
Let's have a look at this. Client auto wired private ZB lifecycle client. Yeah, that should be. Okay, well, let's just type it out longhand and see if we can figure out what is not working about it. 80% of programming is debugging. The other 50% is correctly naming things. And then the rest of it is knowing which stack overflow code sample to cut and paste. Join and then return uh, the topology to string. Topology to string. Now, it doesn't like that for some reason. Let's have a look. Can it resolve that method? Yeah. Let's try this. Go to hmm, implementation. It's there. Huh. Oh, that's why. Okay, we need to import this. Uh, it doesn't like that. Okay, why am I unable to import that? So there's a missing import here, I would say. The ZB lifecycle client. Let's see what things are actually available in that namespace. ZB. Mm, client lifecycle. Okay, I'd say that that's a typo in the instructions. So I will fix that. And then once that comes in, it all works just like magic. Okay, ZB client lifecycle, not ZB. Yeah, I typed it wrong. The, the instructions are actually correct. That's why cutting and pasting is uh, for the win. Okay, so we've created a, a REST endpoint called status. Now, when we request that REST endpoint, it's going to reach out to the Komunda cloud and it's going to contact the broker cluster up there and it's going to request the topology and then return that as a string. You should see that in the browser. So let's see if our cluster is ready to roll yet. I think it should be. It doesn't take too long for it to start up. If we go back to the main page. We can see here it's ready to roll. Okay, great. So we should be able to, in theory now, run the application. Now, uh, to run the application, let's open a terminal. And it's Maven Spring Run Start, something like that. Spring Boot Run. So we run the command Maven Spring Boot Run. Here we go. Building. Will it compile the first time? Yes, yay, compiled. Good, it's gonna start. Attaching the agents. Spring has started. Okay, an error message. Let's have a look. What went wrong? Okay. Null pointer exception. Failed to start the bean. Nested exception there. Null pointer exception. So my hypothesis here is that I've done something wrong with the application properties. Let's have a look. Let's go back and compare it very carefully with the instructions that I was given. And here I can see that there are no quotes around these values. And in my application properties, I've put quotes. So that is the source of my problem. So I'm going to get rid of those. Uh, I'm not sure how you do multiple select in IntelliJ. But these are the ones that we need to get rid of. So let's get rid of them. And then let's rerun that command to start it again. And this time, we should get the magic happening. Thinking about it, thinking about it. Scanning for projects. Here we go, starting up. Good. Uh -uh -uh. <laughs> Things going wrong is an expected part of programming. And it's important not to get thrown by that. You know, you do something, it doesn't work. It's like, okay. Let me go and investigate and see what went wrong. Started Netty on port 8080. So if we now open localhost 8080 slash status, we should get back a topology response from the cluster. Boom, just like that. So here we can see we've got a gateway version 23.3, port it's running on, it's kind of internal um, ID here for the Kubernetes cluster that it's running in, good. Mission complete. Okay. 
you will see the topology response from the cluster, and we did. Now we're going to create a BPMN model. So we download and install the ZB modeler. Let's open that link here so that you can see it. So this takes us to the GitHub page where we can download the ZB modeler for the various operating systems. I'm on Mac OS, and I also already have it installed. So I'm going to go ahead and open the ZB modeler. Okay, so we want to create a new model. Create a new BPMN diagram. Add a start event, well there's already one there. An end event and a task. So, oh, actually the easiest way to do it is we click on here, add a task, add an end event, just like that. Click on the task, click on the little spanner wrench icon, that's this little thing here, and select service task. Now I can make this a little bit bigger, but I can't make the properties panel bigger. Haven't figured out how to do that. Okay, click the task, select service task. We've done that. So now we're going to set the name of the service task to get time. That's the process, not the task. There we go. Name is get time. And set the type to get dash time. Get dash time like that should look like this. There will be a picture there. Click on the blank canvas of the diagram and set the process ID to test process. And we'll give it a, a name, human readable name here. So this is a test process like that. Okay, save the diagram into the resources. So save. Uh, we're in workspace, we're in Komunda, we're in scratch. Scratch, cloud starter, source, main resources. Okay, and we'll save it in here as test-process. Just like that. Okay, now to deploy it, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, all of the heavy lifting that this uh, Spring Framework and this Spring ZB client do for us. So we annotate this class here with deploy workflow. ZB deploy workflow maybe? ZB deployment. Okay, so we're going to specify the class path resources. Copy and paste this time. There we go. Okay, so that's going to deploy it into the cluster. That's going to deploy it up into the cluster, uh, and then we'll be able to see it and operate. But to be able to see it and operate, once you deploy it, you can't see it, any instances of it because operate is the it's the visualization component. And it's all about looking at the running state of the system. So to see the running state of the system, we're going to create an instance of the workflow to see one running. So to do that, we're going to create a new mapping onto start, and then we're going to use the start workflow instance function. Uh, method that we're going to write and then there we just call client new create instance command pass in the process ID send it join it so that we await the outcome make it synchronous and then return the event as a string so I'm just going to copy and paste this part okay we'll add this to here save that yep automatically imported it great we're going to restart the process and run. So it's going to compile, it's going to build it, it's going to uh, start executing it. On startup, it's going to automatically deploy the, the model into the cluster. And then when we hit the start endpoint, it's going to create a new instance of that workflow model that we created. And then we're going to be able to see both the, the workflow instance event response in the browser. And then we're going to be able to look also into the running state of the system to see that running workflow in the cloud. Here we go. Starting, starting. Okay, everything looks good there. So if we now go to here, let's just check that we can still get the status of the cluster. Nope. Still starting. Now it started. Okay, okay. Now if we now hit our start endpoint, we're going to see a workflow instance created here. So a create workflow instance response. We've got a workflow key. 
BPMN process ID version, and then the workflow instance key. So now we're going to have a look at uh, how we see that workflow instance and operate. So I go back to my Commander Cloud console. I go into my Spring Starter cluster, the one that I created for this uh, getting started. Click. Might have logged me. Oh no, here it comes. Okay, so in here, here's the overview of my cluster, and you see down the bottom, workflow instances, view and operate. So I'm going to click on that link. It's going to open the operate uh, instance for this cluster, which is where I can inspect the running state of the cluster. Okay, I got one running instance in total. So if I click on that test process, one instance in one version, it's going to give me a, a list of all of the instances. Uh, coming, coming, coming. There's my test process there. I might turn off my VPN because it's a little bit slow today for some reason. Let's try it without the VPN. So I can see here I have one instance of the workflow that's active. If I click on that instance ID, it takes me into the specific instance. And you can see the token has stopped at the get time task. So it's waiting for a worker to service the get time task. So I think that's the next thing we're going to do, create a job worker. Okay, so we're going to add, oh, we did that. We created this, uh, no, 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 here we go. Compl create a worker program that logs out the job metadata and completes the job with success. Okay, so to do that, we annotate a method with the ZB worker. I'm going to cut and paste. There we go having a little trouble finding this activated job. Yeah, I think I press this button here. Import the class. Uh, this one, why not? Okay, the logger. Mm, interesting. Okay, so I need to create a logger instance. Dun, dun, dun. How do I bind a logger to this? Mm. Oh, there we go. That's handy. Let's copy and paste that. Put it right at the top. I oh, know we'll put it underneath this auto wired one. Logger. Interesting that I. I wonder if I need to mark it as private or public. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, we'll make it a, a method. Oh no. Um, I wonder if I can actually do it here, or if I need to do it, in the in the method itself. No, it's a class property. Okay, looks good. However. It's having some trouble finding this. Let's see. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just drop that into the method to get around this for the time being. It's kind of a weird place to put it, and this is not how you'd actually do it in production. Create, add Maven dependency. It's funny why it can't see itself, because here is the Cloud Starter application class, public class. Hmm. I'm in Java, so it should be fine. Interesting. Let's have a look. 80% of programming is debugging. Class data application. Mm, okay, well, you know, Spring is not my native environment. If you If you're a Spring programmer, you probably looking at me going like, it's obvious, right? But it's not always obvious if you don't know what you're doing. So if you know what to do there, you can do that. Otherwise, we're just going to go full ghetto and just do um, like that. Okay, save that. Because we want to keep moving forward. So let's stop the running application and then restart it. So what we should expect to see happen here is that when the application starts, it's going to create a new worker, and that worker is just going to reach out to the cloud and say, hey, do you have any get time tasks for me to service? That's the type here, which links it to the model via the type on the service task. It's kind of like a subscription, like a, a topic task type. And so it's going to ask for any jobs of this task type, because this is the task type that this particular worker 
services. And all it's going to do is it's going to print out to the console the data that the worker receives from the broker in order to be able to do whatever it does. Here we go, attaching agents, starting. I don't know, if you're a Spring Java programmer, you probably know how to do some kind of like, I don't know, like a hot reloading or something so that it automatically restarts in the background. Save a bit of time. Deployment, okay, it's done the deployment. The ZV worker is here. Okay, and then you see this last line here, this is the output from the worker. And this is the, the data that the worker receives in order to be able to execute this job. It gets a key, there's a type, any custom headers, instance key, the BPMN process ID, workflow definition version, uh, and then the other interesting thing down here, well there's retries, but also variables which is kind of like the, the dynamic payload of the, of the workflow. So usually what you're doing here is you'll mutate that, you'll do some side effects, mutate or update the payload, the, the, you know, the workflow instance payload, and then send that back into the broker. But we, we did nothing to the, to the payload itself. We just said, yep, I'm done. So this would be like a pure side effectful worker. And when I say side effectful, I mean it does like a, it updates something outside, it gets something it would have to update something because if it got something from somewhere else like over rest, it didn't update the workflow variables. But if we go back into operate now to see what's happened here, you can see it's automatically updated and this workflow instance is now completed. Our get time worker did effectively nothing and then just it completed the whole workflow. So that's done. It's that easy. Okay, we're gonna create and await the outcome of a workflow instance. So you know, my application has completed the workflow, but there's no information anywhere in my application about what happened as a result of that workflow. But what you can do is you can await the outcome of the workflow. So if we go into our start method, we're gonna, instead of using the uh, pure create instance command, like just fire and forget, we're gonna add this with result to the builder which causes the application to await the outcome of the workflow. And by default, it's gonna wait for 15 seconds, which is enough time for us, but you, know, you can check into the documentation with how you would wait for longer if you needed to do that. So I say with result, and ha, not after you send it, it's not gonna work there. Let's try it here. Uh, really? Okay, looks like you have to have it in the right location. Uh, uh, uh. Create instance command. Let's have a look at the documentation. Workflow instance result. Yeah, okay, that's why. So you probably can put it anywhere, but the problem is that it no longer returns a workflow instance event. It's going to return... Uh, uh, uh can't infer the type from the, so if I say that it's going to be a workflow result, workflow instance result. So we're going to get back the result. And you know, 80% of programming is debugging, 50% of programming is having the right kind of names for things. So let's, let's practice uh, clean coding here and refactor this, rename. It's no longer workflow instance event, it's now workflow instance result. Huh, I like it. Yep, rename. Workflow instance, workflow instance result. That wasn't quite what I was aiming for there, but that's okay. Let's do it manually. Uh -uh -uh. Visual Studio Code, where I spend most of my time, would have automatically done that for me. Okay, and that's it. So now we're going to restart the program. Stop the program and restart the program. If I was programming in Spring all day, every day, then I would definitely have hot reloading set up so that, you know, whenever I save a change to the... Mm, whenever I save a change, because, I, yeah, I usually save... Yeah, no, I would, I would, I would set it to interrupt the process and, and restart every time I save. Save myself a couple of extra steps. Okay, it's starting, starting, starting.
it took 11 seconds to restart. Okay, so if we now go back to localhost 8080 and we hit this start endpoint again, this time, rather than a create workflow instance response, we get a create workflow instance with result response. There's not really a whole lot to see here, but if we did update the variables during the course of the workflow, we would see the updated variable payload here at the end of the workflow. And we will look at that uh, at doing that next. But that's how you create a workflow, await the response from the workflow, and then you know carry on in your app, your calling applications logic, the client. Okay, we've completed that step. So we're gonna call a REST service from the worker. And I have like a, a basic JSON API that you can use for testing this out. And it just returns the GMT time as a, a JSON object. So we're gonna do that. So let's go back to our, let's try this. I'm gonna stop that now. We'll go into our ZB worker. And what we're gonna do in here is I'm gonna copy and paste this whole block. Minus that last closing brace, bam. Okay, so we, we reach out to this URI using the REST template, uh, Springs like REST client. And we're gonna get back this URI and then we're gonna add it into the variables. Now the variables, the variable payload in the broker is a string, but what it is is it's stringified JSON. So when we pass it back in there, we're gonna construct a stringified kind of JSON string, and we're gonna put the result in, in the time field. Okay, um, it was including the last brace. Save that and run the program. Maven Spring Boot run. So what we should expect to see this time is we're going to create and await the workflow instance outcome and we'll see the updated variable payload which has been populated by reaching out to this REST endpoint and then adding or updating the workflow payload with the result of that REST call. If everything goes according to plan, which I'm pretty confident that it will in this instance, but you know, confidence is the, I don't know, there's probably some saying about that, being overconfident about something. I'm, I'm cautiously confident, cautiously confident that it's gonna work. And I'm not bothered if it doesn't work because 80% of programming is debugging. Uh, last time it took 11 seconds to start. Let's see how long it takes this time. Twenty-two seconds. It's a long time. Um, okay. Start the instance of the workflow. Little rotating circle here lets me know that it's happening. I can see down here that my job worker is activated and it got a job. Uh, still rotating. There we go. Create workflow instance with result response. Let me blow this up for you. Here we go. So you can see the variable payload has been updated and this is kind of weird because like I've added in a whole kind of sub sub uh, object which has a time in it. Um, but yeah, time, it's got sub property time. Bad naming, 80% of programming is debugging, 50% is correctly naming things. That should be something like complete time string, something like that. Um, and then I've got a breakdown, hour, minute, second, day, month, and year. Monday, 6 July, 2020, um, 1.30 in the morning, nearly, in GMT time. Okay, great, that worked. Of course it worked. I had no doubt that it, was, that it, that it wasn't gonna work. So now we're gonna make a decision in the model about what kind of behavior does our workflow have based on the payload variables. So we're gonna go and edit our little model that we've created in here. Let's move this over so we can see that and this. Now, we are going to add a decision gateway. So for the, can I change the size of this? I can, good. So to create a decision gateway, I'm gonna break that link and then I'm gonna add a gateway. Drop a gateway between the service task and the end event. Add two service tasks after the gateway. So we can do that easily like this, one, two. And then of course we're gonna to need to move our 
end event over here, like that. Oh, this looks nice. Yes. Good. Uh, yep, aligned. Good. And then we'll connect these to the end event because they flow through to the end. And let's just give this a name. Best practice. End. Very imaginative. Okay, so remember, we've got to click on the little spanner wrench icon, change it to a service task. Let's do that for both of them. Service task. Now this one here, in the name, we're going to say before noon. And the type is make greeting. And then in this one here, we're going to call it afternoon. And then the type here is also make greeting. So I'm going to show you a couple of things here is the decision gateway and then also how we use custom headers to specialize behavior of a single task type. So make greeting. Key. Okay, so in the headers tab, so before noon, uh, 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 let's move this over here a little bit because my OCD is kicking in and this is asymmetrical. I want to make it look symmetrical. My CPU is currently freaking out about something. Move it over just a little bit, like that. This one over just a little bit, like that. How's that? That looks better. Before noon, okay, so we go into, so I click on that task before noon, I go into the properties panel, into the headers, and I'm gonna add a header, and I'm gonna create a new key, and it's gonna be called greeting. And then it's before noon, so we're going to say good morning. Hard-coded strings. Um, you'd probably do something like, you know, uh, an ID for a, a localized string. And then in here, greeting. And then the value here is good afternoon. So evening, night, everything's good afternoon here. Okay, yep, done that. Okay, so now... Here's how we make the decision. Oh, asymmetrical. Let's fix that. Oh, goodness. Like that. How's that? Yeah, that looks pretty good. Here's how we actually make the decision. So we have an, a, an exclusive gateway. It's going to take one path or the other path. So the before noon task, we're going to put a condition on here. So in condition expression, we're using um, a language called feel, friendly enough expression language. So we're going to examine... And I apologize that I can't make this uh, bigger in that properties panel, but you can see the, the condition here. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Here's the feel expression. It examines the time variable in the variable payload. It checks for a sub property called hour, and then it examines the value of that property. Now, if that property doesn't exist, it's going to throw uh, a, an incident, which is kind of like an exception at the broker engine level which will stop the workflow and then I'll have to manually intervene to fix it. But we do know that that's going to be on there, so we should be good. So, and time.hour is less than or equal to 12. Less than or equal to 12. Yep, that looks good. Let's give it a name. Let's say, um, mm -mm -mm. so any time between midnight and midday, so we'll just call that morning. Um, da, 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 uh, is morning. Like that. Click on here. I'm going to stop the spring application running in the background. That could be taking up all my CPU. And then what we're going to do for the other condition is we're going to make it into what's called a default flow. So if, the, if this condition is met, it'll take that pathway. And then by creating this as the default flow, we're saying in all other cases, in any other case, take this uh, pathway. So we created that as a default flow. You can kind of think of it like a case statement, and this is the default. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to save my model. And we know that when, when I restart my application, it's going to redeploy the new model to the broker, to the, to the cluster. So here's how we implement uh, the variable payload update logic in here. 
So I'm going to copy and paste it in the interest of time and we'll do a little bit of a walkthrough of the logic. Okay. Uh, not there because this is a new worker. This is the, the make greeting worker. So I'm going to grab the whole thing. Make greeting worker. Okay, so here's what happens in the make greeting worker. You know, it's polling um, continuously, but it's a long poll. So it reaches out and says, hey, um, do you have any make greeting tasks for me or make greeting jobs? Any jobs that have the make greeting task type for me to service right now? And the long poll is, I think, 60 seconds by default. So it just waits for 60 seconds. And if any make greeting jobs show up, the broker will return them to the worker. Now, the first thing that this worker does is it, it looks at that job data plus metadata kind of uh, package and it grabs the custom headers. And then it looks for a custom header that has the key greeting. So if we go back to our model and have a look at it, on this task type here, we've created a custom header with a key greeting and it's got a value. So it's going to grab that value and then it's going to grab the variable payload as a map. So it's going to take that stringify JSON and it's going to convert it into a map, you know, like a key value kind of pairs. And then it's going to look in the variable payload for name. And then it's going to construct the greeting by, this is a hello world example if you, if you didn't pick it. It's going to a time-based um, hello world. Then it's going to construct the greeting by taking the greeting and adding the name. And then it's going to update the variable payload with a new key, say, and then it's going to have the hello world piece in there. So one of the things that we need to do to have this work is when we create the um, when we create the Webflow instance, we're going to populate the payload with a name. So if we go back to where we create the workflow up here, we're going to add a variables command. Now, I don't know, let's have a look. How do we construct the variables? Okay, so we just populate it with a um, handcrafted artisanal JSON stringified data. That's my name, Josh Wolf. Pass that in. Okay, now let me just double check the instructions here. Have I got everything? Yep, looks like it. Okay, so we should now be able to run this. Last time it was 22 seconds. The time before that it was 11 seconds. Let's see how long it takes to start this time. Here it goes, scanning for the projects, doing its thing. Recompiling the module. Nope, failed. Let's have a look. I like it. Okay, so this is an interesting one. HTTP status code 503 unavailable. What this means is that my Komunda Cloud ZB broker is being rescheduled on Kubernetes. So during the public beta, uh, it's using preemptible nodes. And because I'm using a single node cluster for this demo, when that node gets preempted and the broker shifts to another node, it becomes unavailable in the meantime. You can also run a uh, clustered ZB on there with like three broker nodes, in which case, you know, you don't get to see this. But let's go back to the cloud console. Go back to my playground. Mm -mm -mm. Actually, what would be really cool is if the cloud console actually told you that that was what was happening. Let's see if it does that. Goodness, the internet is quite slow. Well, it says it's healthy. Let's try running it again, see what happens. I got it. Scanning for the projects.
that HTTP status code 503, you know, 80% of programming is debugging. And I can imagine that you'd get that and go looking for your code. What did I do wrong? And it's really a environmental uh, issue. What is that? It's 12 seconds to restart that time. It's good. There's like five fallacies of network computing. Number one, the network is reliable. Okay, it started. So now when we start our instance, what's going to happen is it's going to create a workflow instance. It's going to populate the initial variable payload with my name, Josh Wolf. The first worker is going to get the time from the JSON API. It's going to flow through to the next flow node. It's going to make a decision about whether it's morning or not. And then that next worker, make greeting, is going to take a custom header off these service tasks, specializing their behavior. And then it's going to construct a, an output. Let's run it and see what happens. Creating that workflow instance. Activated a job, get time, activated one for make greeting. Awaiting the outcome of the job. Sends it back to my requester. And you can see here it has say, good morning, Josh Wolf. So we can make this a little neater. I think it might be in the instructions on how we do that. We get a, a better kind of output. Yeah, here we go. So instead of like returning the entire variable payload, we're going to pull off the relevant one. And here's how you do that. So instead of returning this, let me just make sure I grab the right thing. Yep. We're going to, I think, demarshal, select this one key from the variables. Save that. Okay, is it going to take 22 seconds, 11 seconds, 12 seconds? Start. How many seconds will it take to start this time? 10, 11, 12, 22. Actually, that would be an interesting kind of micro app, you know, where you like make micro bets, wagers about things like how long will it take to start? Nine seconds. Okay, it's warming up. Okay, now if we go back and start an instance of that workflow. Okay, it's activated the two jobs. There it is. I've got back the, this is a hello world example. Good morning, Josh Wolf. My name based on the time getting it over a REST API. So. Here we uh, created a new Kumunda Cloud cluster with ZB, and we created a Spring ZB application. We created a, a workflow model that we deployed into the cluster. Um, let's go to, to end. We'll go back to the Kumunda Operate. And this is an interesting one here because I'll show you how you can find completed instances. If I go into the running instances here, I can actually click on finished instances. And then it's going to update this view here. It's going to show me the completed instances. It's thinking about it. It's reaching out over the internet, it's requesting it. My CPU is going a little bit crazy. Uh, it could be the, maybe it's this. Let me try turning off the background. Ooh, this thing blown up over here. What's happening? Oh, my pod's rescheduling again. Okay. So, my operate pod may be rescheduling at the same time. So in terms of your cluster and how it's structured, you have your ZB broker, you have an elastic search instance, and you have an operate um, instance as well. And the ZB broker does its thing and it exports the data into elastic search and then operate reads the data out of the elastic search instance. So I'll try refreshing this page. And to see whether it has rescheduled yet. And the CPU is still going crazy. But okay, here we go. So we got the completed instances. You know, here's version one for the first one, and then version two is the one with that decisioning gateway that we created. So if I click on the bottom one, 
I get to see it flowing through here. And you can see it shows you the pathway that it took through the process diagram um, before ending up with the ultimate variable payload here of the name which we started with, the time which was added by this worker here, and then the say variable which was added by the worker that serviced this task here, the make greeting task. So there you have it. That is getting started with Komunda Cloud, the ZB broker in Komunda Cloud, and Java and the Spring Java client. Enjoy.